goals of the health system is to increase life expectancy and you know Kenya is to be a middle level income country by 2030. That means that uh, we should be having uh, average life expectancy of 72 years eh? and uh, increase the quality of life. Not only do we look for the quantity of life but we also look at the quality because then quality comes in that we need to subtract the years that we spend in ill health eh? and the years in disability. So you could be living for 72 years eh? but actually you are usefully living for only 50 years. That's the useful economic uh, life that you are having that is beneficial for the country in terms of productivity gains. Eh? And then there's the financial risk protection. You want for you to attain uh, the quantity of life and the quality of life that is desirable, then uh, the finances that is brought, uh, uh, that you contribute to maintain your health must not reach levels that uh, returns you to poverty because then we know that poverty creates illness and illness again lowers years. Eh? So you need to be very, very secure that if you are well, then your expectation eh, is okay that when you become ill, you quickly become well and then eh, contribute to the general health of the population. And therefore, the financing, the health financing model chosen by any country must try to minimize the level of financial risk uh, exposure and UHC requires that uh, the health financing model or strategy that eliminates financial risk exposure should make us realize the two health objectives. Without that it's impossible to, to attain that eh? and therefore as we discuss uh, health financing eh, I want us to look at it in terms of uh, health, I mean financial risk exposure and also in terms of the first two objectives that are indicated and also quality of health services. Now, when we decide as a country that usually when we are discussing health financing, there are three areas that we are discussing. That is revenue generation, pooling, and the method of uh, provider reimbursement. In revenue generation, the only alternatives that we have are tax, and tax house also, when we, are, when we decide as a country that we go through the tax system alone, then we must, we must weigh what kind of taxes would, would, you want, would we want to, uh, to pursue. Do we want to pursue what we call progressive tax system or regressive tax system? In a progressive tax system, you look at the very, very poor. You don't want to tax the people who you intend to protect because that will interfere with their access to services. Now, once you do that, either you decide whether it's going to be progressive or regressive. Now, once you do that, the kind of tax that you, you want to pursue must also be large enough to accumulate the resources that would be very adequate to fund the health system. Now, you have also to realize that if that is your method of choice, if the tax is your method of choice, then do you have enough people in the country, for example, to tax so that then you have the large pool that you would need. So those are the considerations that you, you make. Now, if you tax a poor person, in as much as uh, to the extent that you tax a rich person, and I think in our country, you realize that the first 100, they take 20 bob, the, the next whatever, they take uh, whatever, that's a progressive tax system. Because now there's, a difference, there's a differentials in terms of how people are, are taxed. Now, it's regarded generally that it's a, a, a progressive uh, a tax system. Now, if you overtax the person who is poor, then definitely you are also interfering with the issues of access. You are interfering with the issues on how the provider will behave when it, come, when it comes to your institution. Now, the other way of doing the tax is, I mean, of revenue generation is uh, insurance. Now, if you are in a country where you have fragmented tax system, you know, you have so many of them, then the tax uh, insurance usually behaves, makes their money by those who are healthy funding those who are sick. And that's how they make their revenue. So if you have a fragmented system, then you will, have en you will not have enough pool of people to tax. And you know, I mean, to, 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 to issue, I mean, to, to enroll into the insurance system. And what that means is that the insurance will always make losses because in insurance, I'll tell you, those who usually take insurance, majority of them 
are either ill in a condition that we call uh, adverse selection. Most of the people who are healthy never take, uh, never take uh, insurance unless they are forced like in a monetary system. So if you decide to go the insurance uh, way, then you also have to determine that kind of pool and uh, efficiency that comes uh, with it. The other way of uh, accumulating uh, finances for health is out-of-pocket expenditure. Now, if you do out-of-pocket expenditure, the problem you are having is that you are pu pulling people into poverty because people never determine when they are going to be ill, they cannot save, and therefore when illness comes in, they sell their plots and all that. So, out-of-pocket expenditure is the worst case of uh, health financing, and that's why UHC advocates for the scenario where I just come, walk into the hospital and look for other alternative sources of funding. Now, pooling is also another way, which is uh, mentioned here in the insurance. So you have either to have mandatory insurance schemes, like the National Health Insurance, where you have, again, everybody who is working must be enrolled so that those who are ill pay for those who, I mean, those who are healthy pay for those who are poor. And you have a large pool, like nearly everybody uh, having it. But then that again you are restricted because if you in a country where people are uh, no, there's an employment problem, then you are, are unlikely to accumulate enough resources to fund health. And most of the times what they do is to have a form of tax system and a monetary health insurance. And they try to avoid as much as possible either private, they, they try to limit private because we say most of the private insurances because of the pools, they are not sufficient. Uh, to, for the accumulation of uh, resources. Community-based insurance schemes also exist, but it's a, a problem in this country, it's not well developed, but it suffers the challenges of uh, small pools, eh? and so most of the time they, they collapse. Now, savings is not, you know, you cannot save for, for, for that when you become ill, then you'll use that resources, because you don't know the type of illness. When cancer strikes, you will not accumulate uh, enough resources to, to afford that. Eh? So it's not a viable or way of uh, health financing. Now the last one is, is the method of provider reimbursement. Eh? How do resources, the accumulated uh, resources that have been gotten through the two up there, uh, how do they flow into the providers, to JTRH, to other institutions? Eh? Because then that determines the quality of health services that we will have. Now, what happens is if you decide to, like a UTRH decides that, uh, that the fee for service, when a patient comes, eh, then you charge him as per the cost that you incur. Then if you, we go this way, then the problem is, as a manager of UTRH, I would like that because that is good for me in that I will introduce more because I'm not going to lose anything. Any cost that comes in, I'm, I know I'll, I'm going to be reimbursed. And therefore, the tendency would be for me to overcharge patients. Okay? The tendency would be to overcharge patients. My behavior would be to overtreat patients. You know, introduce, when, when a patient goes to the laboratory, I want to introduce so many, or, 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 I mean, so many of the uh, tests that need to be done. So many are necessary. We see most of these things even in private hospitals. Eh? That fee for service is a disincentive for the rollout of UHC. And therefore, capitation is an alternative. The way we are being an ambassador at UTRH, it means that we forgo the user fee that was forgone is what is plowed back, although it's very much inadequate and has a lot of problems in terms of timelines for reimbursement. Eh? But that has its advantages and disadvantages. Now, what we are doing at, uh, for you to survive under capitation because you are given money in advance and then now you start tre treating patients. Now, the good thing with that is that you want to generate surplus and you can only generate surplus when you are efficient. Okay? You go into cost minimization strategy okay? as opposed to the other one. So that is the only way you can generate surplus and introduce new services and uh, also improve uh, your, 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 your situation. But the danger here also is for a manager that he would wish that his people, his clinicians and uh, whatever, okay, discourage people from accessing facilities. Eh? Because you, you, you want to put people away probably by discouraging them from accessing services. Because that is also an incentive towards 
making surplus. So this dangers have to be when we decide the method of um, the, the health financing method that we want to introduce. All these things have to be there. Capitation has a consequence. Can also be can also support. Uh, I mean, put at risk the financial risk protection for the patient. Because if you are turning away patients, if you easily in, in, in places where the health system is disorganized, then you run the risk of malpractices in institutions from capitation. In as much as also you run the risk of uh, malpractice from fee for service. Fee for service has a profit motive. Capitation has a motive to undertreat patients. So these are things that uh, we need to be aware of as we move towards uh, that. Now, we also have to look at the behavior of the physicians. Now, physicians generally, and the UHCU, that is my, from my observation, they look at uh, when they confronted, that's, that's across physician I'm referring to everybody, the nurses, the clinical officers, those who are providing health services in our facilities eh, under, the pre, uh, under the salary system. Whether they perform or do not perform, at the end of the day, if there's no a system of appraisal and the appraisal is connected to salary, okay, then whether you appear for work, whether the numbers that you are seeing is uh, sufficient, you still get a salary. So salary system is a disincentive for UHC, it's a disincentive for access because under, under the salary systems that we, we are having. So that has also to be examined for UHC to succeed. Now there is a lot of talk also about contract, contracting, where you negotiate. Probably that can be because when you are negotiating for a, a given years, it is very known that uh, if you, let's say for example, if you are a, a surgeon, you are negotiating that you will be doing eight surgeries per week, per whatever, then you are, it's output based. Now output based, output based uh, system of reimbursement most of the times will help universal health coverage and uh, to do that. But then you have to contend with the unions and all that. Eh? So, so you would say, you say it's a political decision. These are some, some of the things that uh, has to be done. And so when we are doing health financing, to arrive at the model that is desirable, all these things have to be taken into account. I have very few slides. And then the other thing is, uh, which I've also addressed here, most of the thing that health financing should address financial risk and quality of health provision. And when we talk of quality, according to UHC, is timeliness. The service should be of uh, time, it has to be safe enough, should bring efficiency, effectiveness, equity. And, and, and patient centeredness. Equity is very, very important. Because if you are running a, a UHC, what I've observed at UTRH, and you are offering advanced specialized services, like uh, diagnostic services, like, you, uh, like CT scan, MRI, what happens is uh, patients who are attending other highly expensive uh, private hospitals, eh, because they know these things are very free at UTRH, eh, and one way or the other, they collude to get these services and go back to those institutions. Now, if you have a rich, rich people who are accessing services that otherwise would be predominantly for the poor, they are crowding them out. Eh? So when you have an uncontrolled system where the rich can push out those who are poor, then you will have uh, those, uh, those who are poor not getting services that are on timeline. Because these people can negotiate, negotiate uh, this, uh, inside the system and push little delay you definitely have a stock out running out because those who do not deserve are coming into the system and, uh, and therefore you want to, uh, uh, I mean, to fit everybody. So this, all these things have to be taken into consideration. And my suggestion is this, for UHC to progress towards UHC requires high performance health financing. And I have said here what it means by uh, high performance health financing. That's funding levels that is highly sustainable, pooling that is sufficient to spread the financial risk of ill health, spending that is efficient and equitable to ensure desired levels of coverage, quality and financial protection for all people. Dr. Soti is here. Dr. Soti will tell you here that I think the last uh, uh, abstracts that I, I read was that in Kenya here, uh, the time spent in illness is two days. Kenya is 50 million people. That means you, if you have two days of people 
in ill health, then it's like taking holidays eh, that is equivalent to 100 million days. Eh? People are sitting at home because they are sick, and now once you want to calculate that, then you can easily arrive at what is needed to fund universal health care. Because now if you have 100 million days eh, and you multiply by health expenditure of six, place it as 6,000 persons per day, I mean 6,000 persons times 100 million, that gives you a, a calculation of 60 billion for buying products and direct inputs into patients. Now, that you've not talked about salary. Salary would consume around 50 and 60 percent. Now, if you do that, then you arrive at the cost of funding a universal health care would come to around 130 billion. So if that is injected into the system, then you'll have all people accessing uh, quality health services. Of course, you have to do other things like correctional for, to have the right balance for healthcare providers. Eh? So that is what is needed. Eh? It's called high performance health financing. That has to be re-looked at. Eh? And then, as health workers, eh, we must be, come again and tell the economies in the uh, treasury that investing in health eh, is not a consumption. You know, people think that you know, when you are buying drugs, people are just going to consume and there is no contribution to health. Eh? That, motion, that notion has now to disappear and we need to now look at health as an investment, something that has economic gain. Eh? And this is the way you're looking at it. Eh? Building human capital, investment in essential primary and community health services such as maternal, neonatal and child health interventions, including immunization and nutrition, fuels the creation of human capital during children's critical years in development. And so you are making these children to be effective when they will be going to school, you know. So you are bringing, a, you know, highly, you know, you have planned in advance to have a highly advanced workforce that is going to help in the future, that's also going to help, because these are going to be efficient consumers. They are going not only to be efficient providers of healthcare, they are also going to be efficient consumers of healthcare. And therefore, it, UHC becomes sustainable. I hope you get my perspective. And so you lay the foundation for improved educational performance and earning potential. Because these people, again, if earning potential, they will uh, contribute to paying payment of the premiums and so on. Eh? Last slide. So I have, in my presentation, I've given my experience uh, at UTRH. Then the providers and consumers, this is a problem. The providers and consumers, that is us and those who we serve, still UHC as, uh, as free. If this notion is, uh, continues to be there if, amongst health providers, eh, then the UHC will fail. Then there's the issue of, uh, of what we call moral hazard for the consumers. We must make consumers be efficient health service providers, I mean uh, consumers of health. Eh? What we are seeing in the UTRH, that those who are not sick, and this is a behavior generally, when, uh, when, see, when people see Kemsa truck hovering around the health facilities, eh, the whole village comes in to, con uh, to get those products. Within one week, it is gone. Eh? Whether they are sick, what these people are doing, they are developing, they are, because of the uncertainties around the health, eh, these people are developing home pharmacies. Eh? And you will see, if you don't have efficient health system, uh, management system, one would collect insulin in Joramogi, because you can't identify them, come again under a different name, you'll give him the same, because I mean, if you go to the test, you'll find the person to be deserving anyway, and you, but you can't identify him. He goes to Kisumu County Referral Hospital, does the same, goes to wherever, and so he will have his own home pharmacies. How many of these people have that? Eh? So we must invest in, a, in, in, in a, in, in, in the systems, I think Huduma, Huduma is a good example, Huduma Center. If you have people with the unique numbers, then you will be able to get rid of uh, those who are not uh, ill, eh? but are rational. These people are not thieves, but they are rational. They want to survive tomorrow. The only way of to survive under conditions of uncertainty is to develop behaviors that make future good. And so these are things that uh, need to happen. Moral hazard is a very, very big problem. Eh? 
Oh, then there is the issue of supply-induced demand, where, you know, you, you guys read World Bank report, where they say absenteeism is this much in our health facilities. It may not be because the methodology is these people come to the facility, they look at the rotor, and then they come again and want to see whether there was arrangement or not. They want to see if the same people were there on job. Eh? And that's how they calculate 60% of the people, of the doctors, whenever they're in the hospital, 52% of the nurses generally, you know, whatever, because probably arrangements, eh? okay? The services are running, probably, because these people, uh, either they have seconded duty or by default made arrangements, eh? so they will not be found at a job. Eh? Now, supply-induced demand is that the provider develops some strange habits. Okay? When we are confronted with a queue, Okay? Let's say 1,800 and you have only around uh, 6 or 10, uh, uh, 10 clinicians in OPD. He develops a strange behavior because he wants to finish these things. So he either decides, do I clear the queue? Which means the patient comes in, he has not even seen this one must be suffering from malaria. And if you are malaria, then let me investigate him to reduce the key. Also, he will come back again. Eh? So you do, you know, you do 20 investigations, eh? but you are depleting resources. Eh? Twenty investigation to delay these patients so they come one by one so that you can manage the queue better. But what you are doing is you are depleting resources. Eh? Okay, you over either over investigating, over treating, and doing all those sort of things. Eh? So the behavior of providers and the behavior of consumers must always be studied if we have to have a UHC to succeed. Eh? And of course, I talked about crowding out of vulnerable people. Those who are unable can easily be pushed away, yeah? may not access, and so that you don't get now the equity objective that UHC is supposed to address. You push out those who are poor because you can negotiate, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you have the power to negotiate in the health system. You know Dr. Soti, you know Dr. whatever. So you get services faster, okay? and the best services, and the poor are left. And uh, then, of course, I've talked about cost minimization, what we are trying to do in UTRH. I think under conditions of plenty also, the problem is people don't think. Eh? But when you are confronted with a little money, you want to save cost. Eh? In UTRH, we were having films all through until UHC eh, knocked. Eh? Then we realized that we are not going to survive. And therefore, we said no to film. We moved to CDs. Because in films, we, we usually see around, uh, we spend around 50,000 per day. On, on, on films, because the film costs around 400, the bahasas that uh, you carry it with it cost 100. So you are, you are having 500. So you say, now how can we reduce this? And we have digital x-ray. Part of digitization is that you extend these things. They're not for decoration. And, uh, we introduce the CDs, now, but now we are facing that, because now we want, uh, we want these images to be transmitted to phones, the doctor's phones, and of course, uh, under, under, under confidentiality and uh, security, the stream to patients, uh, to doctors' phones, to the clinicians' phones, and even the, to, to, to the laptops and all that, as we develop HMI system that would uh, transmit them directly across uh, the computer networks in our thing. Now, the other thing is the challenges when you had set your ambition and you are confronted also with uh, very little money. There's an incentive to cost minimize. Look at the strategies for cost minimization because you, have to, you want to behave like your peers. Eh? You don't want uh, to be overtaken by, say, cost uh, general hospital. Uh, and you, you want, because you want to have legitimacy and relevance. And therefore, that is the only way. Cost minimization under the kind of UHC that we are having, you can only introduce new services when, 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 when you cost save. And now, you must now start to begin. What is the role of nurses in uh, UHC? Eh? I think I've uh, summarized it all. Because nurses are service provider. When confronted with the uh, situations where people regard whatever as free, how do you behave? Uh, that, that is an introspective question. Eh? Amongst you, eh, think about how are you contributing to UHC? Eh? What behavior do you need to extinct in order for UHC to succeed? Eh? That would be, that's a discussion. Now, we need as a country, 
mwisho uh, I know I've finished as a country we must decide do we just put policies in paper of rearranging reorganizing health system or is it the referral system or do we implement it once and for all why would uh, primary health services be at JTRH, be at uh, Kenyatta okay why can't they be at the health center when citizen went around they went to our OPD, because OPD, Kenyatta OPD, Moi referral OPD. They were actually not accessing our mandate. Eh? They were accessing the health center. Eh? Those who are relatively not very sick uh, under these circumstances, definitely uh, priority. We, they should be given priority. But I wish that they went to emergency centers, they went to inpatient, they went to our special uh, clinics, look at the delay to surgery, the delay to all these things. Eh? Then they be start making sense. But the mindset is that we are assessing institutions based on what should not be there. Okay? Because these are the things that should be there, the health centers. Lastly, the role of unions. Eh? If we are to succeed in UHC, the role of unions not now be done. When I brought in the idea of uh, in Kisumu County that we need to reorganize our health uh, system and uh, therefore it means that we need to disincentivize outpatient services eh, so that people go to health centers. Eh. The first people who reacted were the, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, eh, are the clinical officers eh, because they see it as their jobs are under threat. Eh. You see, because they, it was a very, very you know, small thing. The next thing I'm getting a, a very big letter uh, being someone that... Uh, uh, threat to strike eh? and so we must make our health workers understand that this does not lead to job losses eh? in fact it should lead to more you know more more, more jobs eh? because more patients definitely are coming although that is not the objective of uh, uh, UHC eh? and so the position of unions must be taken into consideration when it comes to reorganization of health in order to support UHC objectives thank you and truly, UHC is not free. It's not free. There's nothing free on, in this world. And um, just picking it up, I may not have a question. Maybe just strengthening some points. Not uh, getting out of the reaction of health workers. In the, in, the, in the pipeline, there's a development of a financing strategy. And he has shown you the moral hazards that go with certain methods of financing or reimbursement. And the thing is, is to empower you as a provider to be independent. You don't have to be employed for life. Do your work, organize yourself, you are paid for what you have done. So that we shall have nothing like I have to be employed to work. Think it in that direction, that you are being empowered to make decision what you want to do. Do it correctly as per the standards. Get paid for the work done. That means you can work in the, in the village. Because right now, as we talk about gatekeeping and saying that work has to be in primary health care, indeed, the 60 billion you are computing, if we did our work well and did prevention in the primary health care, then that expenditure will be severely reduced. And that's what I happen to have worked in a private sector also um, and in uh, a health care provider who is also an insurer. That's what you are at the moment, Dr. Ari, that you are a regulator, you are a provider, and you are a financer. That's what we are doing in government today. But in the true world, we should separate all this. So if you are capitated and you are the same people who are paying, you would want to prevent. I used to be sent, I, I was being sent to the companies that are insured to make sure that we give them health talks so that they don't come to clinic for medicine. It's because we are the financer and we are the provider. But if you are somebody who is just providing and then you are told fee for service, then you are likely to over supply. That's what he's talking about. Because you want them to come. A case in point, for example, they are capitated NHIF clients to private facilities. 
You know what they tell you? They tell you that, you know, you have only 1,200 in a year to spend. That's what NHIF has given me to provide you service. What can that do for you? 1,200 shillings, what can it do for you? But it is a wrong information. Because capitation means if 50,000 of you or 500 of you are capitated at 1,200, not all of you are going to get or to go to hospital. So there's no way you'll be told that yours is just 1,200. Once you have spent that, we are not dealing with you anymore. That's what they do. So there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of education to the clients, education to the providers, education to consumers, so that we know our rights and not somebody telling us, you have spent 1,200, your capitation for the year is gone, now you have to pay cash. And I think beyond that, maybe for UHC, is for us to understand the, the, the unique position each of us has in making sure that this works. In the absence of us taking the steps to understand them, we'll always be opposing. And unions, our unions, must also be smart. They start being smart so that it's not antagonism all the time, but finding what is there in this process for us to change tack. Without that, we will keep opposing anything that comes along. Thank you. I have a question. And I think this is the right forum. And the question is, where is this universal health coverage in Kenya? The definition of universal health coverage is that everyone can use the quality health service they need without experiencing financial hardship. And what I would underline is financial hardship. Let's take the case of Kisumu. Is there a place where patients are not experiencing financial hardship? And what is actually the main driver of UHC? Is it National Hospital Insurance Fund? Now, if you go to discussions with NHIF, they say no. Theirs is very different because they have got their own package. So my question is, where do we get the, uh, this UHC? Or are we rebranding anything that we are getting to be universal health coverage? We know that uh, we have had government provided services in public hospitals with very good systems of waivers and exemptions to be able to cater for the vulnerable groups. We also went to National Hospital Insurance Fund. Now, National Hospital Insurance Fund is a membership club. It does not cater for all the Kenyans. And people who can actually join National Hospital Insurance Fund and get the package are the members. So what happens to this group that cannot join National Hospital Insurance Fund? This group that cannot get the waivers and exemptions in the facilities. Now for a good UHC, we need to look at the provider network. Now one is through the national insurance system, social health insurance system, community-based social health insurance and private health insurance. So the UHC we are talking about, uh, where is it? And what is really the role of the private sector? you know, in the UHC. You did a costing of uh, how much it costs to provide UHC. The question is, what is the benefits package that you costed? And how did you split the curative vis-a-vis -vis the preventive and promotive aspect? Coverage, the aim is 100%. Eh? When it reaches 100%, then you are having universal health care. Okay? So Kisumu County and other counties like Nyeri, what they are doing is uh, piloting. Eh? Piloting means to identify challenges that uh, provide bottlenecks eh, to the, uh, the achievement of the objectives eh, as, uh, as needed. Eh. Uh, what I indicated here is some introspection. When you have a, a concentrated industry, okay, that let me use the even you, when, when, when you have a, like the insurance operates, you have so many of them. Eh, then uh, an insurance company, an individual insurance company, will only register very, very few people. Okay? Now, if you register very, very few people, then you are likely to go into a loss. Eh? So you find very many fragmented and unstable insurance uh, companies. Eh? 
that is likely is not likely to mobilize resources for the funding of health in general. Eh? Now, funding of health in general comes into what we call national health account. Eh? You look at what the total expenditures in private and the sources. Eh? In uh, public hospitals, you look at uh, what goes into mission hospital and all that. Eh? Then uh, you bring it into a, pa a package. Then you determine the fiscal space in the country, how many people are employed or how many people can pay the tax or can benefit from that. Eh? Now, that will help you to determine eh, the number of indigents that you have in the country, those who cannot afford. Governments, by its own nature, exist to protect these people. Ideally, a country can choose that those who can afford eh, go into mandatory, man mandatory health insurance, and the government only pays for the vulnerable that you are talking about, eh, the so-called 30%. The issue is how you do identify them. Eh? And we have also a very fluid uh, uh, sector called the informal sector, who are also very rich, but they don't want to come out as people who have earnings. They get more earnings, the people in the garage, they get more earnings than us, but they are not formal. Eh? So part of the strategy is to formalize them eh, so that you get, we bring them into either the tax bracket or to the national insurance bracket so that you increase the coverage. Then you shall have mobilized enough resources for that. Thank you.